If you are captivated by the stunning environments in the first film, you're in for a treat because the sequel takes everything to a whole new level. Welcome back to the fascinating world of Dune. In this video, we're diving deep into the incredible architecture and design and that make Dune Part 2 a visual masterpiece. The results for production design in this film is nothing short of spectacular, from the hidden sanctuaries of the Fremen to the imposing fortresses of the Harkonnens. Every structure in this film has a story to tell. So, all you have to do is to join us as we explore the architecture and designs that shapes the epic landscapes of Dune Part 2. Whether you're a fan of the books, the films, or just love great design, there's something here for everyone. We start on Arrakis with the Fremen sieges, underground sanctuaries that blend so perfectly with the desert landscape that they're nearly invisible. The organic flowing lines of these spaces mimic natural rock formations, a clever design choice award that echoes the Fremen's deep connection to their environment. Siege Tab is masterfully integrated into the natural rock formations of Arrakis. The exterior is camouflaged to blend seamlessly with the surrounding landscape, a perfect adaptation to the harsh, unforgiving environment. The design is organic and fluid, echoing the shapes and textures of the desert itself. Upon entering, we're immediately struck by the contrast between the harshness of the outside world and the sanctuary within. The interiors of Siege Tabara are designed with purpose. Every line and hollow serves a function, from storing precious water to providing safe spaces for the community. The use of natural rock as both structure and insulation showcases the Fremen's deep understanding of their environment. Lighting within Siege Tabar is minimal but strategic. Natural light filters in through small, well-placed openings, casting long, dramatic shadows that add to the sense of mystery and protection. The materials used are primarily stone and sand, which not only camouflage the sea itch from the outside, but also help maintain a stable temperature inside, crucial for survival in the extreme desert conditions. The communal areas are the heart of Siege Tabr, where the Fremen gather for rituals, meetings, and daily life. These spaces are both functional and symbolic, reinforcing the strong sense of community and shared purpose that defines Fremen culture. The design is simple, Yet every element has been carefully considered to ensure it meets the needs of the people who live here. As we shift from the Sieges to the city of Arakeen, we see a stark transformation. Once under House Atreides, the city now bears the heavy mark of Harkonnen occupation. Where we once saw the sleek and functional interiors of the Atreides, we now see the imposing, brutalist feeling of the Harkonnens. The structures are the same, but the way it's shown is surely different. Massive, angular structures that cast long shadows over the city. Once again, these buildings aren't just places to live or work. They are symbols of dominance, designed to intimidate and oppress. Next, we travel to Girdi Prime, the home of House Harkonnen where the architecture takes on an even more nightmarish scale. Here, the designs are harsh and industrial, with structures so massive, they dwarf the people within them. The curved, rib-like formations inside these buildings give the unsettling impression of being inside a living, breathing machine. This is a world where architecture reflects the cruelty and control of its rulers, a place designed to make you feel small and powerless. In contrast, the imperial environments showcase a different kind of power. The geometric patterns and monumental scale of these spaces are meant to inspire awe and reverence. The Empire's architecture is all about stability and eternal rule, as we see on Kai Tang, the capital planet of Imperium. We see a design of a utopian green environment, even as the cracks in their authority begins to show. Pay attention to the way light cuts through these spaces, bright, sharp, and always controlled, symbolizing the Empire's grip on the galaxy.
the Spacing Guild, with its enigmatic presence, introduces yet another architectural style. Their facilities are marked by abstract forms and impossible geometries, reflecting their mastery over space and time. Though we only get glimpses of these spaces, they leave a lasting impression, hinting at the Guild's unique role in the universe. We think the Empire's camp within the shield walls at the end of the film was their role. Throughout Dune Part 2, lighting and atmosphere play critical roles in defining these diverse environments. Whether it's the blinding sun of Arrakis or the oppressive darkness of Gedi Prime, light is used to tell the story as much as the structures themselves. The choice of materials, whether it's the rough stone of the sieges or the cold metal of the Harkonnen fortresses, adds another layer of narrative, highlighting the cultural and philosophical differences between the factions. As we step back to take in the architectural landscape of this film, it's clear that these designs do more than just set the scene. They immerse us in a world that feels ancient, yet undeniably futuristic. Every structure, every room, every vast cityscape tells a story of power, survival, and the endless struggle for control. In the end, the true achievement of Dune Part II's architectural design lies in its ability to make the unimaginable feel real, to bring Frank Herbert's epic vision to life in a way that's both visually stunning and deeply symbolic. It's a cinematic journey that leaves a lasting impression, reminding us of the incredible power of design and storytelling. Alright, that's it. We waited so long for this film to premiere, and it was worth it. Catch us next week as we talk about the tech design and a little more details about the vehicles. As always, my name is Abba, and thank you for watching.